Now we hear the stories and capture the atmosphere of Her Majesty's Chapel Royal St. James's Palace. The Sergeant of the Vestry, David Baldwin, is waiting in Ambassador's Court to take us on a journey through some of the remarkable moments in its past. The Chapel Royal, for me, is living history as well as a, an active spiritual place. And there are several things which bring this home to me every time I walk in here. Everything I look at has some sort of historical association, normally of great significance to this nation. But having said that, of course, its primary purpose is that of a Christian establishment which must live and set an example today. And um, in the past, it was the cradle of music for the English cathedrals. And today, it is very much the uh, leading establishment within the Church of England and has its own traditions peculiar to itself, but which have their justifications and their origins in much earlier days. And I feel as though I'm almost encapsulated by a sense of heritage, which is unequal. Here we are in the uh, Chapel Royal, as we see it today, as a building, which was started in 1532. But of course, the Chapel Royal isn't a building. It's a body of priests and singers and laymen appointed to serve the spiritual needs of the sovereign. Its origins are much more ancient than this building. It goes back to the days when the sovereign was in progress around his realm. And the Chapel Royal had to say the various offices of the day in his company um, for his spiritual welfare. The Chapel Royal comprises at the top uh, a dean, um, who is today the Bishop of London. Uh, in days past, didn't have to be a bishop. Then underneath the dean, we have the sub-dean. He's really the working head of the chapel. And the sub-dean today is uh, Canon Anthony Caesar, who is both a priest and a musician in his own right, and consequently um, reflects the past of the chapel rather well. Well, as sub-dean, it's my first responsibility to ensure the proper ordering of all the services at the Chapel Royal, remembering, of course, this great liturgical and musical tradition behind us. The Chapel Royal exists today as a place of worship, primarily, and, I mean, we have no sort of organizations during the week. We don't act like a parish. So these two buildings that we use have a great feel of worship, because nothing else really ever happens in them, you see. And that surely is something to cherish. And nowadays, we don't travel very far. Um, medieval days, chapel traveled wherever the sovereign was going to be, from residence to residence, castle to castle, even battlefield to battlefield. Thinking of the role of the chapel royal in time of war on the battlefields of Europe, Perhaps the most famous example would be that of the Battle of Agincourt, where the Chapel Royal found itself singing mass by royal command at dawn on the day the battle was to be. O oh God of battle, steal my soldiers' hearts. Possess them not with fear. Take from them now the sense of reckoning, lest the opposed numbers pluck their hearts from them. The king was present in his colorful scarlet and gold robes over his armor and wearing a magnificent bassinet on top of which he actually wore the crown and so he attended the service dressed in his splendor and the dawn mass was 
duly sung, and being the day of St Crispin and St Crispinian, a very uh, emotive day it was from the point of view of the readings necessary at the Mass. But the preparations were not made wholly until the mercies of God had been called upon by the Chapel Royal to protect the King before the battle. Also, glad to say that the outcome was as the Chapel Royal had hoped. There's a pleasing thought that the choir must have been at Agincourt. It probably helped to sing the Agincourt song when it was first written, and was at the Field of Cloth of Gold. It is a curiosity to think that you are in some small way, the end product of that tradition. The choral element of the Chapel Royal itself comprises the six gentlemen of the chapel, which is a term for the lay singers of the choir, and the ten boy choristers, known as the children of the chapel. Good morning, boys. Welcome to the Chapel Royal. Particularly a warm welcome to those of you who are joining us for the first time. We'll see what we can do about issuing you with your uniforms. You'll see that the state coats here in the cupboard, on my right, are rather splendid. They're made out of doe skin and dyed scarlet. It gets very heavy during the sun, but you have to get used to that. And it's not like um, all the other choirs, well, most of the other choirs with all the white robes and that. You know, it's uh, it's um, quite original and it's much better than the other choirs, I think. And I'm very proud of wearing it. The it's made out of deer skin. We look more like beef eaters. <laughs> they don't like being called beef eaters, they get, <coughs> they get highly offended. Well, I think it's much nicer than the traditional white. I mean, because it's gold, gold braided and red. It's much, it's just like, if you're in white, you look like a ghost and everything. Well, my name is Norman Cooper. I'm the senior gentleman of the Chapel Royal Choir. There's a curious, almost magical, uh, indefinable quality about this choir. I don't know what it is, but I personally find it an extremely happy place to work. And I think that probably can be said of the other gentlemen. Richard Edwards is a, a very common name in the annals of the Chapel Royal. There have certainly been three, to my knowledge. I've now been in the chapel for 18 years. There is a conflict of loyalties in that one would like to spend uh, time with your family at home at weekends, and the other pull on your feeling of loyalty is to the other singers in the choir. I'm conscious that my colleagues endeavour whenever they can to be there, and I feel that I must respond in kind to that. It is on occasions such as the Feast of the Epiphany that, as a gentleman of the Chapel Royal Choir, one is uh, reminded of the splendid tradition of musical service that we're helping to carry on. Gold, frankincense and myrrh was offered to Christ as a child and uh, this is commemorated uh, still today in the Feast of the Epiphany service, hence the um, provision by the Queen's apothecary of uh, frankincense and myrrh for the Queen to present and also gold which today takes the form of sovereigns but in the past has taken the form of a couple of rolls of gold leaf. So these are taken to the altar by the gentleman ushers and uh, pre presented to the sub-dean who takes them and then in turn presents them to the dean who offers them at the altar and uh, there they remain for the rest of the service.
It is against the chapel rules for any member of the chapel or indeed um, guest at the service to uh, wear spurs or carry a pistol or indeed a knife. So the ceremony of the spur money has continued at the end of the service at the Feast of Epiphany. Um, the youngest chorister challenges the, one of the gentleman ushers who is deliberately required to infringe these rules by wearing spurs who in turn uh, requires him to recite the gamut which if he does successfully he is then recipient of some money which is then shared out amongst the other choristers assuming he doesn't get away with the whole thing. Sir, a child of the Chapel Royal desires the honour of addressing you. Sir, I perceive the wail of the spurs within Her Majesty's Chapel Royal and I therefore beg to request the payment of the customary spur money due thereon. Why? Before acceding to your request, I require you to repeat the gamut. Well done. One of the peculiarities of the Chapel Royal is that it had to take the religion of the sovereign. And so consequently, in the 16th century, there is a period of uh, turmoil from the point of view of the Chapel Royal composers who uh, found themselves at the start of the century. You know, we have uh, the Roman Catholic rites in Latin, and then with the onset of the formation of the Church of England, we have the Protestant rites in English, and composers of the Chapel Royal were given the very particular task to lead the nation in recomposing for um, whichever sovereign happened to hold a particular religious leaning. And uh, fortunately, the Chapel Royal had the musicians to cope with it. And one thinks of people like Thomas Tannis, uh, William Byrd, John Shepherd, uh, to mention just a few. Richard Popperwell as organist and choir master and composer. I'm very conscious of the privilege of working here in such a wonderful tradition. Hector is this magnificent handsome by bird in many parts, and it is to the words, this is the day that the Lord hath made, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and alleluia. And uh, the, the sense of triumph and joyfulness is absolutely wonderful. Bird, I think, on the whole, is my secret favorite because his choral music is so diverse. The uh, ideas are so original and so vivid and dramatic. And I'm always putting his music in the services. does on the whole transcend what uh, was going on at the time. Religious music always does. It's purely concerned with religious contemplation and not with wars or strife. It is always the uh, panacea to which people look and hope to gain some comfort and satisfaction. I think the uh, Chapel Royal achieved a, a wonderful national sense of identity in choral music. There was wonderful music in the 16th, 17th centuries being written all over the world. But here we have our very much our individual voice, our individual vision of God and of eternity. And it is wonderful to pick it up from the past and re-perform it nowadays. Well, St. James's Palace played a very important role in the circumstances surrounding the death of Charles I in 1649 and it was the area above the main arch of the great gatehouse that he resided in before his execution. It was the place too where he had his last communion
on the morning itself, um, he took communion from the Bishop of London. Bishop Jackson and uh, the King were great friends. They were allowed to be together um, in these last days. It was a bitterly cold late January morning when the King prepared for his execution. As he dressed, he was troubled, lest he tremble. Let me have a shirt on more than ordinary, lest by reason. The season is so sharp as probably make me shake, which some observers will imagine proceeds from fear. I would have no such imputation. I fear not death. Death is not terrible to me. I bless my God, I am prepared. It was ten o'clock when the king was told it was time to go and the little procession set off from the upstairs room in St. James's Palace. So the little party set off down the staircase, which is now used by the Chapel Royal Choristers from their practice room to come down to underneath the colonnade and round to the colour court door of the chapel. Surrounded by an escort of halberdiers, they passed through the garden into the park. The way was lined by companies of foot soldiers, and it is said the drums beat and the noise was so great as one could hardly hear what another spoke. Thus, they made their way to the private apartments in the banqueting house Whitehall, where the king spent the time in writing and in prayer. He had wished to take nothing after the sacrament, but was persuaded to take a little bread and drink a glass of claret. Shortly before two o'clock, the final summons came. The king walked to the scaffold, the bishop by his side. The spectators marveled at his bearing. With wonderful courage, he delivered a long speech asserting his innocence. For which I die. I die a martyr of the people whose liberties I aimed at supporting. If your gracious majesty would say something for the world's satisfaction. I die a Christian according to the profession of the Church of England. Executioner, I shall say but short prayers and then thrust out my hands. I have good cause, Bishop, and a gracious God on my side. There is but one stage more. This stage is turbulent and troublesome. It is a short one. You haste to a crown of glory. I go from a corruptible crown to an incorruptible crown, where no disturbance can be. You are exchanged from a temporal to an eternal crown. A good exchange. Chapel Royal had its own theatre in Blackfriars, and this was decked out for the use of the sovereign's entertainment of diplomats and their visiting dignitaries. And the Chapel Royal choristers, of course, uh, were great play actors and uh, were very proficient at it. So much so that Shakespeare was uh, not at all happy. And indeed, there are references appear in some of Shakespeare's plays, notably Hamlet, in relation to those little iases, which uh, refers to the Chapel Royal choristers, and who indeed were great rivals. There is, sir, an eerie of children, little iases that cry out on the top of the question and are most tyrannically clapped for it. These are now the fashion, and so we rattle the common stages, so they call them, that many wearing rapiers are afraid of goose quills and dare scarce come hither. What? Are they children? Who maintains them? The dean at the time and some of the chapel clergy had certain misgivings about the young choristers playing on stage, but um, the Lord Chamberlain uh, stopped any chance of a dean objecting and uh, stymieing the activities of the theatre by simply not appointing a dean. So consequently, we have a reign of six Lord Chamberlains in the chapel royal in the place of the dean. So the Lord Chamberlain's um, interregnum coincides with the heyday of the theatre, and um, we can clearly presume that this was because it was a good way of uh, sidetracking any ecclesiastical objections to what was going on. I personally wouldn't have had any objection. It was um, very strange that, I, I don't know, I think he must have been a Puritan, the dean of that time. I think that's what's accounted for. 
I think it was most regrettable that the dean was, uh, as it were, put into abeyance for those years. I can't see it happening today at all. I mean, for one thing, of course, there is quite properly such importance attached to the worship at the chapel for a while that uh, I don't think that it would ever be considered that the dean of it was unnecessary. The dean of the chapel for a while today is the right Reverend Graham Leonard, the Bishop of London. As dean of the chapel for a while, I suppose my responsibility, uh, really, is to ensure that the worship uh, which is available for the Queen and for the court is properly provided. That, I think, is the overall uh, responsibility of the Dean, and within that, of course, he's responsible, as is clear from the history, for uh, things like discipline, ensuring that the uh, members of the chapel, uh, the choir, and so on, behave themselves. Uh, I've never had to deal with that. It's never come my way. They've all been very well behaved. In fact, I always feel that, as Dean, I, I have to learn from them, because, in fact, nobody actually t tells you what you have to do when you become Dean of the Chapel of Royal. The warrant of appointment merely says you will enjoy the rights and privileges, but they don't tell you what, uh, what your duties are, so you have to learn them as you go along. <laughs> days gone by, there was a choir school in South London. Eventually, that came to an end, and there was an arrangement made with the City of London School, beginning in 1923, for our boys to be drawn from there. Well, they have to pass a double test. One is a voice test, and then they have to pass into the school itself. My name's Simon McGregor. I'm suborganist of the Chapel Royal, where I've been playing for two years. I also teach at the City of London School, and I take the boys' practices there at the school during the week so that they don't have to make unnecessary journeys to the chapel, which I think they find is much easier. When the boys enter the choir, they're normally 10 or 11 years of age, and they join the school at the same age because they're comparatively old, if you compare them with boys of cathedrals, we don't keep them for as long as they do. Uh, normally we can expect to keep them till about probably the age of 14 at the latest. This actually makes it quite hard work for the rest of the boys because constantly we've got new faces appearing and old boys disappearing in a very short space of time. Um. Could you please have a look for those boys in particular who haven't got the sound of book at the hymn, Oh God, I help in this class. This is for the service, the cenotaph service on Sunday. You need to know the words. Right. Okay, can you put the chairs on? John Lake. The cenotaph is special to me because although I carved the inscription of the last war on the east and the west sides, I was uh, there in, my, in a capacity as keeper of the closet from 1971 to 1987. And when I left, I thought that my long association with the cenotaph and indeed with uh, St. James Palace, would have been severed completely. But um, I was very pleased when I was elevated to the position of uh, Keeper Emeritus, because I still feel that I now have a link with the chapel and with St. James Palace. These stairs lead up here to the uh, 
uh, royal gallery or royal pew, which, should the sovereign or her representatives be present, would form the royal closet on that occasion. And so consequently, just outside the door here sits the keeper of the closet, the chapel official, whose task it is to usher and to um, prompt the sovereign or her representatives to move at various points in the service, or indeed um, to come down for communion. And as we go in, and here we see we're looking down the chapel from really quite some height, and above us here is the William and Adelaide ceiling, and beyond that is the Holbein ceiling of uh, 1540. It's quite some drop, and these are on splendid deep maroon velvet cushions here with uh, gold fringes to them. And as we look down here from the Royal Gallery, on the right-hand side, as we go towards the altar looking at it, is the uh, pew where members of the royal family would sit, or senior members of the household when they come to the service, if they wish to sit below. The other pews here, which face one another in an antiphonal sort of way, are occupied by the regular worshippers here, and, of course, parents of choristers and their families. I'm Jamie Kiddy, and I'm the youngest of the Majesty of Chapel Hill. I'm Anthony Geraldina, and I'm the newest of the members at Chapel Hill Choir. I remember the first one, because you go in procession, and and we kept them sort of prodding me, saying, walking steps, and this, I'd say, left, right, left, right. I remember I still can't get a hang of walking step properly yet. It's doing me harder. I'm still walking. Oh, I uh, got very nervous when I just walked into the chapel. I couldn't believe I was there. And I was just, I wasn't, I didn't bother to look around. I was concentrating. And I was always dropping things off the, because it's quite narrow space where you can keep your folder and your books and everything for the service. Now I'm getting used to it. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercy. I'm Anglin, and we, we first came to the Chapel Royal when my eldest son Lawrence sang in the choir, and then my second son sang in the choir, and since he's left we keep on going because we enjoy the chapel so much. I like that prayer book, you know, the poetry of that prayer book. And the, the music is obviously marvellous. And also, everyone's very friendly. And Anthony Caesar makes it, it a friendly place to worship, so everyone talks to everyone. And, and also, I think having a different preacher each week is interesting. Because you get such a diversity of people coming. And we get um, someone from Liverpool who does a lot of work between the Catholics and the Protestants. And, someone from Stoke-on-Trent who does a lot of work in the inner city industrial. It's just fascinating, the people who come. They're just so different, and uh, they've always got something to talk about which you hadn't thought about. I'm John Richards. I'm the Marshal of the Diplomatic Corps. I'm one of many members of the royal household who live in St. James's Palace. And whenever I can, I do attend services in the Chapel Royal. Uh, it's right next door, so of course I don't have any problem with uh, traffic, parking, or bad weather. It's literally a few paces uh, from my back door to the pew in which I sit. But it is special to me for a number of reasons. Uh, the music, of course, is absolutely superb, the organ music and the singing. Then one is always aware of the historical significance of the chapel. Although it still has a, uh, an intimacy about it, I like the way the services are conducted, and they are familiar to me. I think familiarity is very important. I think one needs to be comfortable with one's religion. As Marshal of the Diplomatic Corps, you would expect me to be a supporter of tradition and ceremonial, and of course, I am. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is given to be preserved by body and soul into our hands to be the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given to be preserved by body. Marvellous, especially at the uh, service of Eucharist, of especially Christ. when one sees that long queue of people going up to take communion, the and the boys are singing the preserved communion hymn. That is, of course, one of the, the of high moments, Christ, and I'm quite sure that that is my best recollection 
of any communion services anywhere. It was quite a long morning, but nothing, nothing like three services on the trot near the beginning of the century. Nothing like Sir Thomas Armstrong used to experience on Sunday mornings. It was a very hard life. We had to travel up by train from Streatham Hill Station to Victoria and then walk from Victoria Station to St. James's Palace, wet or fine, wearing those heavy uniforms. And in the summer, this was really very exhausting. And on two occasions, I fainted, and I wasn't the only boy that fainted. On one of these occasions, which was in Buckingham Palace Chapel, I was pushed under the seat until the service was taken over and then looked after. And on the other occasion at Marlborough House, I was kindly taken out and put in a chair in the passage leading from the chapel of Marlborough House to the house where Queen Alexandra was then living. And she passed by after the service and stopped and talked to me very kindly and she gave me a kiss so that I have the proud memory of having been kissed by Queen Alexandra. One of the highlights of our year is when we go off to the Royal Maundy service and the whole organization of this is done by the Royal Armoury Office and the secretary is Mr. Peter Wright and without him I don't think there would be a a Maundy service at all. It really is a Chapel Royal service, and wherever the service is held, the Chapel Royal Choir have to be there. And it is held on Maundy Thursday, and of course it goes back to what one might call the very first Maundy Thursday of all, from the New Testament story, when Christ took this towel and basin of water after the Last Supper, and he washed the feet of the disciples, and he said, I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. And it is this example which we are remembering and trying to follow in this present age. And uh, the Queen is really following and setting that example when she goes to the people just as our Lord went to the disciples to wash their feet. So now the Queen is coming to her people to redeem her Maundy gifts. And there are four of us who still wear a linen towel in memory of when the feet were washed. White purse contains the actual Maundy money, which is a, a penny for each year of the Queen's age. And the red purse contains, in ordinary currency, the money that they used to have for the food, the money they used to have for the clothing, and also an extra pound uh, going back to the time of Queen Mary I. Well, now, Queen Mary used to take off her lovely velvet gown and give it to the person whom she supposed to be the most worthy of all. But Queen Elizabeth I didn't like this idea, and she said, instead of redeeming my gown, I will instead give a sovereign to all of them. And this pound is still paid to this very day. My name's Graham True. I've been in the choir now for 15 years. I think this is my 15th year. The first of the really large services that I was involved in was in 1977 in St Paul's Cathedral and the Queen's Jubilee service. And the royal household who were involved at that time were all given a, a Jubilee medal, which Four of the gentlemen still wear every Sunday, there are four of us left who, who sang in that service. Um, the two big royal weddings since then, and some more intimate occasions which have been very enjoyable, such as the christening of Prince William inside the music room at Buckingham Palace, which of course, being a small room, is, is just the Chapel Royal Choir, which is nice in itself. I've been lucky enough to sing 
a solo in the anthem posed by Richard Powell for that christening, and it's a very informal atmosphere. You see the royal family at their most informal, of course, because there are, it's a family occasion for them as well. That, that makes it much, much more relaxed for everybody. I did write an anthem for Prince William. It was a lovely occasion, and I was very conscious of the fact that he would probably be a future monarch. And I tried to write something very special for his special day. being at Princess Beatrice's christening and he feels as, as if he's sort of going over history, if you know what I mean. When you look at the royals, you look at them as if you sort of, you could see all the different kings and queens being there at the same christening, but for all those years back. And then the queen came up and said, thank you for seeing us for us. And um, yeah, it was really good because she was so near and he thought, wow. It is a great commitment to make, but I think it's a worthwhile one. And it's the sort of thing that when you leave, it's only when you leave that you realise how much you loved it when you were there. It's only at certain times when you think, I'm very proud to be here, or I'm, I feel very good about being here. You realise what a special place it is, and how special you are to be there, something you remember for the rest of your life. In Royal Company was produced by Christine Morgan.